Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, the phone hacking story in Britain heads into the home stretch. We'll look at the new rules for print journalists. We need a system of tough, independent self-regulation. And how they'll be enforced. Turkey reaches a ceasefire agreement with Kurdish separatists. But can Prime Minister Erdogan ever make peace with the country's journalists? In Pakistan, reporters can be killed with apparent impunity unless that reporter is American. And what's with Instagram, anyway? It's our web video of the week. In 2011, the British phone hacking scandal at Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation brought the world's most powerful media organization to its knees. By the end of 2012, Lord Justice Levison, the judge who headed the inquiry into press and politics in the UK, recommended that the government draw up Britain's first press law since the 17th century and create a new independent body to regulate newspapers. This past week, after months of squabbling, the country's three major political parties agreed to create an independent press regulator with the power to impose fines and demand corrections. Basically, it's a new version of the old Press Complaints Commission, only one with teeth. As of yet, the major newspapers have not agreed to sign on, and the details, such as whether this will affect new media, have yet to be worked out. But this is a major development in the UK. Our starting point this week is Westminster, where for the first time in more than 300 years, a British government is preparing to regulate some of the world's most aggressive print journalists. I have today reached cross-party agreement on a royal charter that will help deliver a new system of independent and robust press regulation in our country. For the first time ever, we will have a system of self-regulation that's genuinely independent very bleak moment. I think a red line on press freedom was crossed. Regulation is not fun and if you can write your own regulations that's the next best thing to not being regulated at all. How do you effectively achieve an oxymoron? How do you regulate the free press? My message to the press is now very clear. We have had the debate, now it is time to get on and make this system work. They were burning the midnight oil at the mother of all parliaments. Members of Britain's key political parties and a group representing victims of phone hacking met well into the night, coming up with a new system of regulation to replace the PCC, the Press Complaints Commission, the self-regulatory body that proved incapable of dealing with the gross intrusions of privacy conducted by the Murdoch press that led to the public inquiry and the judge's eventual recommendation that a stronger, independent regulator was needed. And the big problem with the Press Complaints Commission was that it was really set up by the industry and run by the industry. The crucial thing for the new self-regulatory body is that it's independent. It's independent of government and of industry. That is absolutely fundamental to any system of accountability. A stronger regulator would have been able to give redress to people whose privacy had been invaded. Um, if it was imposing the kinds of fines that they're talking about, this would have forced a change in the business model because it would no longer have been a source of cheap headlines, if you like, to run these kinds of stories if there was a form of redress that was able to you know, inflict substantial commercial or financial penalties. The Press Complaints Commission was rightly criticised for not responding fast enough and starting to investigate when some of the allegations of phone hacking came up. But equally, if we had new cases of phone hacking in the future, why would the regulator investigate those rather than the police? Now, if the police are investigating them, the regulator may want to step in and say, what's going on in the newsroom that is not part of the criminal complaint or alleged action? What, what are editors doing? But the police did not really investigate the phone hacking scandal, nor did the politicians, apart from a few lone voices. Why? Because News Corporation, which controlled 40% of the British newspaper market and boasted of its ability to elect or defeat prime ministers, was something to be feared. And the company is no smaller today than it was at the height of the scandal. And people forget that. They think the Leveson inquiry was the be-all and end-all. And one of the key things that, they, that was completely missed out of Leveson, really, apart from the couple of pages in his 2,000-page report, was anything to do with the concentration of press and issues of plurality. So in the UK, we have one of the most concentrated 
press in you know, the whole of the developed world. That's something that has to be tackled at some stage if we actually believe there's a relationship between a news media and democracy. That would have been a much broader and much more relevant conversation in a way. Because whether you have a strong regu regulator or not, the problems in the press and the media go much, much further than the intrusions of the tabloids. Uh, they go into the heart of how the media treat powerful institutions. Such as governments. But the Cameron government wrote the terms of reference for the Levison inquiry, and it kept the concentration issue off the table. Still, the tabloid press, led by the Murdoch papers, found plenty to criticize in the new rules of the newspaper game, even though the regulatory system they face will not differ greatly from what British broadcast journalists have had for years. And for all of the resistance against the idea of statutory regulation, it was always coming. The press have already lost this battle. Indeed, you could argue that the press lost this argument by their own behaviour in the early 2000s and later that led to the Leveson inquiry being set up. The, the, the argument for the press was lost by the day that Lord Justice Leveson sat down on his great high stool in that court 18 months ago. And I don't think anyone could possibly claim there was anything for them to win here. And we saw the Sun had Churchill on the front page saying this was D-Day. The Telegraph said Cameron had crossed the Rubicon. We've seen the Times saying I think it was a sad day. And we've seen the Independent say hold the front page, but then on the inside say actually this isn't perfect, but it's not bad, let's get on with it. The British government is prescribing a regulatory cure for an industry that was already ailing. UK newspapers, like those everywhere, still haven't figured out how to make up for revenues lost to online competitors. That's another thing neither the inquiry nor the government addressed, should the new rules and regulations apply to news available online. In the end, the question of social media and online was too difficult, and so the politicians, as Leveson did, shrugged their shoulders on it. I mean, the issue really is, are we fighting the war of the last century? Are we trying to fix a problem that's going to die anyway? You know, is it like trying to create rules for how to, to, to do horse-drawn carriages 10 years before Ford created the motor car? And there's a quote from the German philosopher Hegel. He said that the owl of Minerva takes flight at dusk. And what that means essentially is that you can only start to talk about a phenomenon once it's in decline. The fact that we're talking systematically about the print media in Britain now 30 years, 40 years after it was clear that there were, there were issues with self-regulation of the press, it indicates to me that this may well be dusk for the print media and that Leveson is, 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 is as it were, formulating a, a brilliant solution for 1970 rather than for you know, 2020, 2030. And that's something that no regulator, independent or not, can fix. Our Global Village Voice is now on the regulatory upshot of the phone hacking scandal in the UK. Remus of the new regulator applies to any website that covers news or current affairs and has a predominantly British audience. Does that mean that my podcast will be regulated? Does that mean that my tweets will be regulated? I'm not a big company, nor are most bloggers and people who write online, so if I get a scary letter from a company threatening to take me to a regulator, I'm not going to put up much of a fight, because I don't have the resources to do so. I might start thinking twice about saying anything vaguely contentious online. Instead what we've had is a fix-up between the major three political parties in Britain, who have successfully got what they've always really wanted, which is a press that is regulated, frightened and unlikely to ask the difficult questions. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. More than 10 years after the gruesome murder of the American journalist Daniel Pearl in Pakistan, there's been a new arrest connected to the case. On March 17th, paramilitary forces in Karachi arrested Kari Abdul Hai of the outlawed Sunni extremist group Lashkar e Jangvi. Officials are accusing the group of involvement in the kidnapping of the Wall Street Journal reporter, but not his murder. Pearl was abducted in Karachi in January of 2002 while investigating links between Pakistani militants and Al-Qaeda. We Americans cannot continue to bear the consequences of our... A video was released a month later showing the journalist denouncing U.S. policies in the Middle East. Then his throat was cut and he was beheaded. His latest arrest coincides with a crackdown on Sunni militants following a series of explosions. Two bombs went off in Karachi, one of them near a cable TV station, killing a total of 48 people. People. Hello. At least 88 journalists have lost their lives in Pakistan over the past decade. That's according to the Doha Center for Media Freedom. But what justice there is seems to be reserved for American journalists. 
of all those cases, only Daniel Pearls has brought any convictions. Hacking into news organizations and messing with their content might be somebody's idea of a joke, but the U.S. Department of Justice is not laughing. The DOJ looks like it's about to throw the book at Matthew Keyes, who in 2010 was a web producer for the Tribune Company, which owns the Los Angeles Times. Prosecutors are accusing Keyes of helping hackers infiltrate the Times' website and tamper with a news article. The story in question was a rather dry piece about a tax proposal. It was changed to give a shout out to someone with the tag Chippy1337. Prosecutors are saying that a user named AES Cracked in these transcripts was in fact Keyes. If convicted, the 26-year-old faces charges that could land him up to 10 years in jail. He'll appear in a federal court next month. His current employer, Reuters, has suspended him with pay. There are critics who say that prosecutors in this and similar cases are going too far. The latest in a long line of prosecutorial overkill aimed at online activists is how The Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald described it in a tweet. The Aaron Swartz case has been brought up as another example. The social media innovator and internet freedom campaigner committed suicide earlier this year as the DOJ pursued him for downloading and releasing academic journals. Last week, we ran a report on how laws in Thailand that make questioning the role of the king a crime are stifling political debate in the media there, and how even talking about the law can amount to breaking it. The issue has come up again through a television program whose title translates to Tackling Thailand's Problems. The first four episodes ran as scheduled, pushing the boundaries on issues such as the role of the monarchy and Section 112 of the Criminal Code, the Les Majesté law that protects the Thai monarchy. Then on March 15th, a few hours before the fifth and final episode was due to go on the air, a small group of pro-monarchy protesters gathered outside the PBS TV building in Bangkok demanding that the show be cancelled. That appeared to spook the state-owned broadcaster. The final episode was pulled. Then the channel did a quick U-turn. PBS aired the show three days later without notice. Some politicians have since called the program offensive to the monarchy, trying to defuse tensions. The chief of the army said this past week that the show was inappropriate for a country mired in conflict, but it was not illegal. Ever since the election of Tayyip Erdogan and his AK party back in 2003, Turkey has been presented as a modern and mostly democratic state, a political model for the region. Supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the Anada party in Tunisia often say that Erdogan and the AKP have proved that parties like theirs, which seek a greater role for Islam in politics, can govern and preserve democratic values. However, Turkey's image is suffering as a result of the Prime Minister's heavy-handed approach with journalists who refuse to toe the line. In recent years, Turkey has jailed more journalists than any other country, often under a vaguely worded anti-terrorism law. It's usually been applied to coverage of the Kurdish separatist movement. In the run-up to the recently announced ceasefire between the biggest Kurdish party, the PKK, and the Turkish government, it remained a sensitive issue. Just days before that announcement, a prominent columnist, Hassan Jamal, suddenly disappeared from the pages of a leading newspaper, Milliyet. And Erdogan's cozy relationship with conglomerates means that he can squeeze the ones that own media outlets from all kinds of different angles. The listening posts Flo Phillips now from Istanbul on the red lines that restrict Turkish journalism and are even starting to affect entertainment programs on television. When it comes to the Turkish media, it seems what the Prime Minister wants is often what the Prime Minister gets. He has a passion to create his own media. It's up to Erdogan. He determines the red lines, so it's a daily process. You have to keep up with the rhythm. He's a street smart person whose personal coda is based on toughness and uh, which makes him um, very vulnerable to external critique. He's very confrontational, that's his style. Um, and if the media do his bidding, that's fine, but if they don't, he'll, he'll be after them. A country of 75 million people, Turkey has a multiplicity of media voices. 250 private channels, more than 40 national daily papers, hundreds of radio stations. Most seem to adopt the party line. The exceptions, and there are a few, feel the heat. 
In January, 11 journalists were arrested during a raid on a Marxist political party meeting. Police said the group were planning to attack and murder government officials. Five were sentenced to jail, joining the 64 media persons already behind bars. Turkey is currently the world's leading jailer of journalists, thanks to the liberally interpreted anti-terrorism law, a law that highlights deep structural problems within the Turkish legal system. The reason why there are so many journalists in jail is about Turkey's not so democratically minded anti-terrorism law. The great majority of the journalists in jail are people who wrote things that are positive about the PKK and Turkish legal system consider these as, as crime. If you look at the numbers and who are in jail, uh, we can see that it is almost exclusively a Kurdish problem or Kur problem related with the Kurdish journalists, publicists, editors. They have been often chased and charged, investigated under anti-terror law. And this law, as we all know, is the heart of the problems. We often say, as long as Kurdish problem remains on the agenda, uh, we cannot really talk about freedom of the media, freedom of expression in Turkey. Back in 2011, there was an extraordinary meeting in Ankara in which the government summoned newspaper editors and basically said, you know, you have to toe a patriotic line on this particular issue. And the Kurdish issue has not gone away. What was announced on March 21st was a ceasefire. It was not a peace agreement. And in the days leading up to it, Erdogan's war on journalists covering the issue intensified. Less than a month ago, one of Turkey's major daily newspapers, Milliet, ran a headline story detailing leaked minutes from secret peace talks between the two parties. The report did not go down well. Kim bu çözüm sürecini baltalamaya çalışıyorsa o benim de arkadaşlarımın da hükümetimin de karşısındadır. Less than 3 weeks after Milliet published the leaks, the paper's top political columnist Hasan Jamal suddenly quit. Media insiders say Jamal didn't jump. He was pushed out of the organization after weeks of government pressure. If you're working in a government supporting media, then you are free to talk about Kurdish issue as well as the other taboos. But if you're not supporting the government, then uh, it can become a terrorist act when you speak about Kurdish issue or the other taboos. And I think the strongest taboo at the moment is not Kurdish affairs, not Armenian issue, and not the, the other classical taboos, but only uh, the government and the prime minister himself. There is only one main state TV channel in Turkey, TRT Turk, but it's by no means the only one over which the Prime Minister wields influence. It's hardly surprising the AKP gets good press here, but dig a little deeper. The various and complex business relationships Erdogan has forged with some of the media barons who control private channels means the Prime Minister now finds himself with favorable coverage across a large percentage of the country's media. For him, it's good politics. For them, it's good business. Much of the media is owned by proprietors who have interests other than media itself, and therefore the government is able to dangle several carrots in front of the media. So when we talk about the media being oppressed by the government or the media being controlled by the government, much of the media is only too willing to do what the government wants it to do in return for certain favors. Take the you know, media group A, who's owners are at the same time owners of the banks or construction companies etc and, and those companies often are willing to enter public tenders as soon as they win those big projects the uh, prospect of good investigative journalism in order to expose uh, corruption or critical coverage disappears in this kind of environment um, journalism itself becomes sort of a prison Big media conglomerates have been known to speak out. The most famous example, a quarrel between Erdogan and Doyan Yangin, the group that once controlled more than 50% of the country's media. Suddenly, the media giant was facing a tax bill of $2.5 billion, forced into a fire sale of its media assets just to stay alive. It served as a pretty good warning to other mainstream channels attempting to criticize the government. Politicians routinely try to affect news coverage. Some try to control it. But late last year, Erdogan moved into the cultural arena, weighing in on Turkey's most popular soap opera. Sultanım,
Magnificent Century is based on the life and reign of the 16th century Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, and is watched by millions. But ultimately, one viewer's opinion matters more than any other. Erdogan speaks a lot, and he speaks on everything. I mean, if he sees a soap opera, which in his mind is not compatible with Turkish values, he goes and lashes out against it. He's putting his finger into everything. After he spe spoke about the Magnificent Century, I think they got the message as well. Or they were teasing him maybe, because there was too much praying, actually. So it's like they want a uniform life. They want a uniform life of media, culture, and all daily life as well, maybe. The AKP has drafted a new legal package which could lead to much needed changes in the anti-terrorism law. But that will not resolve the systemic problem in Turkey's media space. There aren't enough journalists challenging the vested interests of the country's press barons, and media freedom remains hostage to the nexus between government, industry, and the news business. In the past decade, Turkey has changed considerably. But media freedom is still something that we haven't established yet. And the more Erdogan realizes that this image of Turkey, in which the media is not free, is hurting himself as well, internationally and even inside Turkey. I think he will uh, adjust his behavior. For 10 years after coming to power, Erdogan is moving in the other direction, controlling more and more media coverage, tolerating less and less criticism. A government that's a model for others in the region? Turkish journalists would argue that the opposite is true. More Global Village voices now on the deteriorating state of journalism in Erdogan's Turkey. One of the biggest problems that we have here in Turkey right now is 80% of major media production is coming from just few media conglomerates whose business interests are still alive in many other sectors. That means they have to establish somehow good relationship with those major political powers. As AKP consolidated its majoritarian hegemony, it has worked a lot to silence dissident voices within, within media, especially Kurdish or, Kurdish or leftist journalists. What is missing is now not only uh, freedom of press, uh, but also basic human rights of uh, journalists in Turkey. Finally, as a few Arab governments have learned over the past few years, social media can be a serious business, but it can also be pretty frivolous. Ever heard of Instagram? The online photo sharing service with its square aspect ratio and array of digital filters seems to turn anything from pictures of your pet, your breakfast or your fingernails into a must share image. It's an out of control online phenomenon that's been picked up on by the team at collegehumor.com who with the help of a tune from the Canadian rock band Nickelback have done a pretty good job at showing us just how self-obsessed Instagrammers can be. With 2.7 million hits online, look at this Instagram as our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Look at this Instagram. It's been an inside of him. Started out as a lemon tart. Then my phone went and made it art. Everyone look at my feet. Get jealous that I'm at the beach. Probably knew I was going there You saw my planes wing in the air Look at this coffee foam Now look at this pretentious tome Now look at this garden gnome I'm freaking Michelangelo Are you bored of city lights? Try seeing them in black and white Putting glasses on a cat I'm the first one to think about